No. So, okay, I'll, I'll test it and then. Yeah, I'm still having trouble getting the plug in to work as well. Okay, what's it saying now, Camden? Um, I unzipped the second newest version from 2017. Um, but when I try to unblock like the whole folder, it's not letting me do that. Um, like you see an unblock button or you just see nothing? I'm just not seeing an unblock button. So then I, I just tried to drag that folder into the like special folders in Grasshopper, but then I restarted and it's not working. Okay. What, what windows are you running? Uh, 11. Okay. Um, can we try downloading the zip file again? There should be an unblock button. You need that. It's just, well, I can go in and unblock individual like, files but doing the whole folder it doesn't pop up you just can't do the zip folder i can try to do the zip before i unzip yeah it. do the zip before you unzip it yeah okay yeah that that works mm. possibly i don't know <laughs> maybe <laughs> I just put it in the components folder, right? Um, I believe so. If it has any orange components, those always go in user object. But mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think everything can just go in the components folder today. Yeah. Yeah, I got the second one. Okay. So you're good to go then? Cool. Yeah, you can also look at this. Yeah, I think it's file that should I just do. Okay, Camden, how's yours going? Um, I'm just I having some problems, but I think I've got it figured out. Uh, I like renamed the unzipped folder the same, and it's not letting me replace it in Rhino. But okay, just... yeah. If you keep the file explorer open and and close out Rhino and Grasshopper, then it should allow you to move files around. It, sometimes it doesn't let you move while the programs are open. Yeah, that's what I'm running into. Okay. Cool. Uh, I think I should be able to figure it out here. Okay. Time, so. Yeah, well, it looks like everyone else is good to go. Um, so I'll hop over here. Um, everyone's able to see this, correct? And does everyone know how to draw a curve and then secondly make a surface in Rhino? Is there any questions about that? No? Cool. Okay, yeah. I figure it'll be faster just to use these to get started instead of making them again. Um, the surface was just made by lofting two curves together. So it's pretty simple, but you could really make any surface you want. Um, yeah, you can do a lot with this, but okay. So if you can see lunchbox up here, the main thing we'll be looking at today is the panels tab. And this is where a lot of different 
uh, kind of lattice structure, um, grid structure patterns are. Um, Lunchbox was developed mainly as a structural tool and then also a machine learning tool. So there's a lot in here, um, a lot that we won't get into. There are some really interesting primitive surfaces though as well. Um, like there's some there's some crazy stuff in the math tab if you want to take a look in there. Uh, we talked about Mesh Plus last week with some other primitives that they have. Um, Lunchbox also has some interesting primitive surfaces. Um, I guess no BF strip. So yeah, take a look in there, but we won't look at it much today. If you're into machine learning, there is stuff in here. I don't know how it works. So you can ask me, but I might struggle. But today we'll be looking at the panels mostly. And in particular, we'll be playing with the diamond panel component today. Um, and this is going to give us the shape that we saw in the examples from a couple minutes ago. So if you grab that component, um, this one, as you can see, has three different inputs, surface U and V. We've talked about U and V a couple times in here before um, in relation to the MD slider, I believe, uh, from the Voronoi class. Uh, does anyone have questions about the UVs? You kind of remember kind of how those work. Um, yeah, we basically have a surface and we can define a point on it based on the, the U, kind of the X and the V, kind of the Y um, values there. So um, we'll use the U and the V today to define how many uh, diamond panels we have on the surface. So we can start by plugging the surface into surface, uh, probably pretty obvious. Um, and then U and V by default are 10. So we can see we have 10 uh, panels of diamonds across both, both edges of the surface. Um, and the panels really don't fit to the surface too well. Each uh, diamond panel is a flat plane. Uh, it's not going to be curved to the surface. So the more panels we have, the more curvy it will be. And the less, the more faceted it'll look. Um, but we can use a slider to change this number. Um, so I'm going to go pretty low and pretty high from 1 to 100. So we just have a lot of range there with the amount of panels that we can create. And we'll just duplicate that slider for both U and V so we can control both um, axes of this surface. So one and one is not going to do much. Um, we only have one panel in either direction. Um, but you can bring these numbers up to whatever you want. And you can see if I move one, we're getting just one direction of duplication for the panels. And then if we do the other one, we'll get the other direction as well. And we'll start filling it in with more and more diamond uh, panels there. And again, feel free to put these numbers at whatever you want. Um, if the two numbers are very different, you'll get uh, elongated diamonds. If they're near similar, because the surface is square-ish, um, they'll be pretty even uh, getting closer to just squares on the surface there. So whichever numbers you want will be fine for this tutorial. Um, everyone will get slightly different results, but they should all work perfectly fine. So. The process here to turn these panels into um, a textured surface, so kind of those bumps that we saw a few minutes ago, is if you can imagine, I'll do a drawing again. If you can imagine just one of the panels uh, in this grid of cells, and um, we have a flat square there, but if we want to change the shape of this, so kind of make it come up or down on the surface to add that texture, what we can do basically is find the center point of each of these uh, diamond panels, and we can either raise it up or down uh, from the plane of that surface. So if one surface is like this, we can raise it up. If one surface is like this, because our surface is quite curvy, we can raise it that way. Um, so we'll keep them all normal to the surface of the plane. And then once we move that point, we can connect all of the other points of this diamond together to kind of make a pyramid. And then once we have a pyramid, uh, we can do that for any of the panels we want. And then we can use Weaverbird, which we downloaded last week, to kind of smooth out um, this ridge as much as we want. We can make it pretty smooth if we really wanted to get our final uh, shape. So that's the theory of what we'll do to these panels. Um, and we'll build in a lot of 
uh, adjustability with sliders to control all the different aspects of this and use an attractor curve to define where the pattern is. Um, so we'll build all of that out now. Um, I did also give you a surface. And again, if you want to change this, feel free. Um, you can bake this in to Rhino and manipulate the curves there, or you could draw a new surface just like we did last week with the necklace and move it around same way with the control points. Um, and I'm just going to work off of this current one that we have here. Um, and anytime we do an attractor point or an attractor curve, anything that's attracting other uh, pieces of data in Rhino, um, we usually always break it up either into points so we can find the closest point, or we can use a component um, called curve closest point to find the closest point on a curve. In this sense, that'll be the easiest option since we have a curve. So we can use the component curve closest point. Uh, and what this will do is we have the curve um, but now we just need to find the center points from all these diamond panels to match up with this. So I'll grab that, and then we can plug the curve into the curve input to complete that. So now we can start searching for the center points, um, but we'll need to find those first. So uh, the easiest way to just find the middle point of any object, whether it be a mesh, a bounding box, a B-rep, a curve, anything, um, is we can just use an area component. And we've used this one a couple times before. This is just the simplest way to get the center of a thing. There's a lot of uh, discrete components for different things, such as a centroid. If you have a, like a polygon, um, or middle, if you want to find the middle of a curve, specifically on the curve. So there's different ones for different options, but area will just give us the most basic center point that there is, so that one's pretty easy to use. So if we plug diamonds into area, um, this will find the center point of every single diamond. Which is pretty helpful. Um, it's not finding the centers of any of the triangles, which is fine for now, just the diamond parts. But since this uh, panelization is not exactly on the surface, um, as I said earlier, each of the diamonds are flat, so they're not actually on the surface itself, um, any of these midpoints might be slightly above or below the surface itself. Um, so we'll want to find the points on the surface just to make this as exact as possible. Um, and that is pretty easy um, with the data that we currently have. And um, one thing we can use is, and, and a tip for Grasshopper 2, in most of these tabs, uh, like Mesh, Surface, um, a bunch of them, they have this Analysis tab, even Curve as well. They all have this Analysis, so you can figure out a lot about a certain data type um, with any of these options from the Analysis tabs. So if you have a curve, you can find out a lot about the curve, but in this case, we have a surface. Um, so we can analyze the surface and figure out, you know, the points that we have here, where are they on the surface itself. Um, we can use the surface closest point for that, so this one right here. Um, so basically we have points, we have a surface, and now uh, with those two we can find which points actually sit on the surface itself based on the points that we have currently from the area. So we can see it has two options here, a sample point and then the surface itself. And we have both of those. We have the points here and we have the surface. So we can plug those in together. And this isn't the cleanest setup, so don't get confused, but the surface component is wiring through the diamond panel, so not actually touching it and going into the surface closest point down here. So that's changing our point list just a little bit. Um, you can subtly see a difference as the points are snapped onto the surface itself. So now that we have these points, um, we can really easily uh, use these as the closest points to start the search with the curve closest point component. So we can grab those points that come out with the P output, plug that into the curve closest point, and we'll see all the points are now populated on this curve. Um, and the thing we care about here usually with the curve closest point is the distance that each of these points was away from the curve. 
And we can visualize it really quick. And again, you don't have to do this part. Um, but if we visualize the start points, so all of those points on the diamonds to the curve, um, we can see how the points are finding their way to that curve, which is visually um, what it's doing. So the closest. Um, if that makes sense, we don't actually need this line though. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna delete it, but uh, that's what it's doing right there. So now that we have the distance um, to this curve, we can start to set up a algorithm that tells us um, how much to move the pattern based on how far away it is from the surface. Or in this case, if we have a curve here and we have points around it, um, how many points do we want to include in the pattern and how many do we want to get rid from the pattern? So if we have the curve and we say we only want to include the points in a certain radius around the curve and then not use any of these, that's the first thing we can set up. And then once we know what points we want to actually affect with this attractor curve, um, we can then take these points and start moving their center points up um, to actually make that pattern. And one thing we can do with both of these pieces of knowledge as well is since we have the distance for everything, we selected the ones we want to move, but we can also move them on a gradient. So the points closest to the curve, we can move the most, and the points farthest away, we can move the least. So we can have a nice fall off of the pattern there, and it's not just a hard, like, a lot of pattern and then no pattern. Uh, but it's pretty editable too if you want to change this in the future to get whatever results you're looking for. Um, but the first thing we'll do um, with this distance um, is we want to know which points to include and which points to exclude uh, from our search. So we can use a component called includes, and this will run a test on a set of values, in this case the distance values, and we can tell it which distance values we want and which ones we want to keep out. Um, so you'll see two inputs here, the value to test for the inclusion. So these are the things we'll do the test on. In this case, that's the distance. So we want to test for which distance is too far, which is too close. And then to do that, we'll need a domain to test with by default at zero to one, which is kind of arbitrary for us um, because on the grid, zero and one is, is quite small. So we'll make our own domain and we can do that always with construct domain. And this will allow us to add uh, two sliders in, one slider for the lower bound, one slider for the upper bound. And then that'll create a new domain for us. And we can do that with sliders. So I'm just gonna go pretty small, like in the decimals to something really big. Um, I probably don't need that big though, maybe 20. But up to you, I mean, any, anything will really work. And we'll see how, what this is doing in a second. I'm just gonna duplicate this slider to get one for A and one for B and plug those together. And we can add that into the domain. So now we have the domain set up. I'm just gonna move these values um, so it's low and high. Um, but it's not gonna do anything visual yet. Um, if we wanna see pretty much exactly what this is doing, and this step is, uh, it's not gonna be in the workflow, but just to show like what these sliders are doing, um, we can use a component to visualize, just to visualize called Cole Pattern. Um, you'll see for the includes output of this component, we're getting a list of true false values. So basically a pattern of yes or no, is it included or not? Um, and we can use that pattern just for show in this Cole Pattern. I'm gonna, since it's good to keep the data similar. So since we use the distance values, they're 340 in my case. Um, if we want to visualize this, we'll make sure to use the exact same um, points. So kind of in the, the same line here, if we use anything else, the data might get messed up. Um, but I'll use those points just to look. Um, actually, those are on the curve. Never mind. Let me use the ones actually from the surface closest point. Again, just making sure I have 340 of those. So that lines up. Um, if we start to move these sliders, we'll see, we'll get the list of points. Um, to get smaller or larger, if I start moving the B uh, slider, the domain end, and that's just simply visualizing which points we're keeping, and then everything else is getting left out um, of, of, uh, of this workflow, so we know which ones we can affect. Uh, 
Um, but again, this is just for show. We're not actually using this too much, but if you just wanted to see, that's what that does. Is that making sense so far, everyone? Yeah, cool. And hello. Um, since you just walked in, uh, yeah, there's a plugin to download yeah. and then a starter file. I don't know where it is. No, perfect. Hopefully, the people around you can help out a little bit too. Cool. So, yeah. Okay, so now that we have these distance values and we know which ones are included and which ones aren't, um, what we'll want to do is we don't want to mm, kind of destructively work with this list. So, in the sense of when we're removing points, we don't actually want to remove them from the overall workflow um, because then our pattern won't look like the surface anymore. And the thing I want to keep here is the shape of the surface itself. So if you're making like a grip for a handle or something, the overall surface stays there even if we're not affecting the entire surface. So we're just making a pattern on part of it. Um, so when doing this coal, uh, We'll want to keep the distance values for the points that are in green here. Um, so let me draw again. So we have the curve and we have some points and then we ha have a cutoff. We know the distance for each one of these points. Say this is one, this is 0.5, and this is like 0.2 or something away from this curve. Um, we want to keep those distance values and say everything else beyond this. Uh, is just going to have a number of zero, so we don't do anything to it. Um, but the importance of keeping these values here, these distance values, is we can use this data to inform the gradient fall off, so it's highest around the curve, and then lowest almost zero out here. So the distances as we go away from the curve are getting larger, but we'll want to remap those as we go on to say the ones closest are going to be the, the highest. So that could be like it moves up by 10 to make a really high pattern. And then at the end, we're going down to like 0.1. So these barely move at all. And that'll have a, a nice fall off from high to then zero at the bottom. Um, so that's what we'll be trying to do. And in order to do that, we can't, we can't break the list. We can't have less than the 340 points. We need to keep that, that data structure intact. So, in order to do that, um, we'll want to replace all of the values too far away just with the number zero. Um, in order to do that, we can use a component called replace items. And that'll take a list on the list input. And it'll take some indices on the lowercase i input, so the, the indices to replace. And then it'll use a value that is in the items input to do the replacement with. So if we say index one needs to be replaced, we can replace index one with zero, so on for all the points that are outside of our domain. Um, so in order to do that, we have the distance values, which I said we need for the fall off. So we'll be affecting this list, the, the list of the distance values. And we'll be affecting it based on which points are not included in the list. So which points have the value of false in this list are going to be the ones we want to replace with the integer zero. Um, so in order to figure out which indices have the value of false in them, we can use a component called uh, member index. And what this will do is it'll take any set and it'll take a member to search for. So you could search for any data pretty much. You could search for like a number, a letter, uh, but in our case, we're searching for a true or false value. So we'll want to say we want to search for the member that is false. So in order to tell it that we want to do false, we can just use a toggle, a Boolean toggle, just like any time you would ever want to input the value of false. And we'll give that to the M input. So now it's going to search our list for anything that is false. Um, and we'll want to actually input that list as well. So we have the includes output, which is a list of true or false that we can do the searching on. Um, the i output here is going to tell us which members, so which false values um, we have and, and what the indice aligns to with each of those false values. 
So we see the list here, at least for me, is saying two, three, four, five, six. If we look at the index here, let's just pull a panel uh, for visual. We'll see that two, three, four, five, and six are all false, and zero and one are true. Um, so just cross-referencing that, that seems to line up. All of the false values are in two, three, four, five, and six, and so on. If we looked at the whole rest, um, that should all track as well. So now we have the indexes that we need to replace with the number zero, so we don't do anything to them as we move on. So we can plug those indices into the indice input of the replace items. So we know what to replace. We just have to tell it what to replace it with. In our case, we're replacing it with the value of zero. So we can do, you could do a slider of zero. You could do a panel of zero. The panel is my personal choice because we're not, we don't want to change this ever. The slider kind of gives off the vibe that we can change it, but we don't want to change this at all. So we can plug that in. Um, and again, for grabbing a panel, you could type in the name panel and that would pop up. Or a little bit quicker, you could type in two forward slashes, which will define that you want a panel. And then you can plug in the data you want in that panel. Just like when you're making a slider, you can put in the numbers. You can do the same for a panel here. That'll just quickly give us a panel with zero already infilled. Okay, so we have the items replaced with zero. If we look at our list now, two, three, four, five, and six should all be zero. And we do see that two, three, four, five, and six are all zero. And everything else has a number on it, which is good. <clears throat> um, we could do this just to show the numbers. Let's see. So don't don't do this. I don't even think you're able to do it. Um, but we can see now if we visualize this with numbers on the surface, and I'll grant you it's a little bit hard to see. Um, but we can see that all of the numbers that are too far away have a value of zero, and everything close up retains its distance value from the curve. So at this point, if we were to update the sliders here, we can see it's changing as we change this. So everything within that distance is now getting farther away and it has the numbers on it. So that's what we've done. We've replaced everything too far away with zero. So that looks pretty good. Yeah, a little bit. It does look like a minesweeper. Um, and we can see I have the largest distance of 2.67 here. If we look at some of the farthest ones out, we get numbers really close to that, 2.56. So that is, that is working. Um, just to visualize, though, you don't have to do that part. Um, we'll see if it's all working actually with the mesh in a few more steps. But OK, we have that. Uh, we have uh, the points defined in a region, and we have a fall off of numbers to 0. Um, so the second part here, we have our first slider set. And you can group this if you want. So we have that slider set. And we'll want to do a second set of sliders as well. And this second set is going to actually control the offset of the pattern, so how much we're getting the undulation kind of of those pyramids. Um, so to do that, we can start by creating um, another domain. So we'll use this domain as our distance values. Um, and we can go maybe a little bit smaller here. Um, I'm going to go negative 10 to 10, but up to you. This will allow us to push the pattern up or below the surface, depending on if it's negative or positive. And again, I'm going to duplicate that for A and B, so we have both. And if you want to group these just to keep everything clean, feel free to do so. You can just select everything, right click off to the side and hit group. Or if you're using your hop key menu with your middle mouse button, you can also group it that way. Okay, so now we'll actually want to take these distance values that we have and remap them within this new domain. So we have the distances, um, but now we actually want to do the, the 10 to 0.1 part. So everything close will be really high at 10, and everything far away will be, will be pretty small or negative if you wanted to. Um, but we'll see what those sliders do in a second. So in order to do that, we can use the component called remap numbers.
Um, and again, this is going to take any input list. So say the original value distances of 0.2 to 1 are our original list, and we want to change them to be within the bounds of 10 to 0.1. Um, that's what the remap will do. It'll take an initial list with the bounds of that list, so 0.2 to 1, and it'll uh, then change those numbers to be within this new bounds of 10 to 0.1. So anything that's 0.2 will become 10. Anything that is 1 will become 0.1, and so on for everything in between. Um, so we'll need to do that for our list of distance values with the zeros that we have here. Um, so this is the list we'll want to remap, so we can add that into the values to remap input. Um, we'll need to know the input domain as well. So what's the domain of our list that we're plugging in? Uh, this default source is not going to work. Um, so we can actually figure out what it is with a bounds component. This will just tell us what the domain of a list of numbers is. So same way we constructed a domain, this one is just taking a domain and telling us, or taking a list of numbers and telling us what the domain is. So kind of going backwards. Um, from constructing. So we can plug our initial list of distances into the bounds. So that's going to be all of our hundreds of values with zeros in them. And then this will tell us what the domain is. So in this case, uh, I have 0 to 2.6, which would make sense because the original list we did is 0 to 2.67. So, so that tracks. And we'll use this as the source domain, so the uppercase S source domain. And then for the uppercase T, the target domain, that's the domain that we set with the construct domain. So this is the domain that we can affect uh, and change to make our pattern change. So now that we have that list, is that uh, working for everyone so far? We got it all wired up. We don't see anything yet, but we will see something shortly. Um, and just to end off here, uh, before we actually use these as movement values, you'll see now that the list that I have, um, we can see all of the numbers that used to be zero. So we see index zero is zero. Um, in the resulting remap numbers, it has now become four, uh, which is going to make it move, which we don't really want. We want those to stay at zero. Um, so we'll just use this replace item strategy again to make sure that all the numbers we want to be zero stay at zero and are not affected by our domain that we constructed. Um, so we'll do this process again. So we'll replace items. And again, we're replacing it with a zero just like last time. And then once we have this, um, we have our list that has been kind of corrupted. The zeros are now fours, which we don't like. So we'll want to make sure this list stays at zero. So we can plug the remap numbers into the input list to modify. And then we just need to know again which are the indices to set at zero. And we already know that from the member index over here on the left. So we know which indices we want. So we can just use this uh, same output again in the indices input. And if we do that, the list, again, should have zeros in the spot where they're supposed to be zero. And then we have our actual values that we want in the correct positions. So we should be seeing a list with zeros in it again. Um, so now the movement should all be, or the movement value should be set. So we have that ready to go. Okay, has everyone seen a list with zeros in it? So what's your list coming in? If you hover over the uppercase L, what does it look like? Um, and you're just plugging the distance into that uppercase L? from the curve closest point? Okay. Cool, yeah. Awesome. 
Okay, so now we have these distances. Now we know what points we want to move and how far we want to move them. And everything else that we don't want to move is set at zero. So in order to move, we can use this component called move. Um, this will, the inputs for this one are the geometry that we want to move and then the vector of where and how far we want to move them, the directionality and the distance. So we have those two things. Um, for the geometry we want to move, uh, we know what those points are already. If you remember from my original sketch of this one, we want to move this center point. And we have the center points from this area. We have all the points on the surface. So we we'll want to kind of zoom out a little bit. We want to use these center points as the geometry to move. So I'm just going to drag this all the way across the canvas. We want to be, be moving those points. Um, when you plug them in, they should shoot up uh, on the Z axis by a value of 10 by default. So we'll see some movement starting there. And again, this is all the points, not just the points that are close to the curve, but every single point here is moving up. Let me know if you don't see any movement. So, um, yeah, that's easy to, to see, but it looks like this, you just need the area to move, but we'll just want to move that point so the C is the C output is the actual point. Yeah. yeah. The area is just a number. Um, yeah. Everyone else? Yeah. 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 Um, all my points move down. I don't know if that's a problem. Down is fine. Yeah, as long as they move somewhere. Um, yeah, we'll say so. The question in the room, which yeah, this is a tiny one, but we want to make sure we're moving the the centroid points and not the area. But it is really easy to mix that one up. I don't know why there's not just a something simpler, but yeah, we should see some movement. It doesn't matter which direction it is. We have the direct. We we have the distance here from this replace items list, but we just need to find the direction to move the points now. Um, and that'll define the actual movement of them. So um, in order to do that, we'll need to actually evaluate the surface again. So we'll need to analyze the surface and figure out what the normal value of the surface is. So what is the direction away from every single point on the surface based on the normal of the surface? So in order to do that, um, we can use a component called evaluate surface. So this dome with an arrow coming off of it. And this one, uh, yeah, it has two inputs, so surface and then UV. So we have the surface, and we just need to tell it at which UV coordinate to do the calculation on. So we'll look at that. Uh, again, we have the original surface from the very first surface component. And we just need the UVs to evaluate at. Um, the reason why we did the surface closest point originally is because it also gives us not just the output of the point on the surface, but also the output of the UV coordinate at that point. So we already know uh, the UV coordinates of every single point, and we can use that in coordination with the UV input on the evaluate surface to actually figure out everything about the surface at all of the points on the surface. So it's giving us a lot of output. So a point at the UV, which we already knew that. It's giving us the normal at the UV, which we do want that one. Uh, it's giving us the, the U direction and the V direction at that position. And also the frame, which is what we're visualizing here, is every single plane and its orientation at all of those points. And you can see if we move around all those planes, even though they're bigger than the original points, they are in the orientation of the surface wrapping around it. So that's what you should be seeing at this point. Um, and we'll want to make use of the normal and the frame at some point. But uh, in order to move on, I'm just going to move this component over to the move side of things. And we'll just work on the right side of the document at this point. We have everything we need over here. So we know what points to move. Uh, we have the normal vector off the surface. 
And I'm going to preview this one off just because it's a lot currently. And to visualize it, you don't have to do this point, but to visualize the normals, there are custom vector displays in the display tab of Grasshopper. Uh, and this one, if you want to follow along, it needs a position and a vector. So we have that. We have a position of the point and a normal vector. And vectors usually are not a visual thing. We can't see a vector. All it is is a, it's a direction and a distance. Um, in this case, all the vectors are normalized to a distance of one. So they're all the same length at this point. But we can actually see uh, how the point arrows are pointing based on the curvature of the surface here. So they should all be pointing with the surface. That's just for display. We're not actually using this. As you can see, there are no outputs for this component. So can't make much use of it. What we can do uh, is we can take the vector and the distances that we have in the replace items and merge them together into a direction and a distance. And we can do that with a component called amplitude. Um, an amplitude will take a vector and it'll take uh, a length for the vector and it'll merge them together and it'll give us a movement vector that we can use with the move input to actually move these points in the correct direction with the correct distance. So before we do that, I'm just going to turn off or preview off everything except the input surface to keep this clean for you all. Um, so we have amplitude, and we need a vector and a length. We have a vector here from the normal, so the ones I was just visualizing. We have those normal values. And we also have the distance from the replace item. So that's going to be all the numbers with the zeros. So if we plug those together, uh, we get vectors now at each of those points with each of the distances combined. So in my case, our value of 1.89 has been transformed into a vector of that length in that direction. And we can use this vector with the corresponding t value in the move component. And if we look in Rhino, that'll start to move our points in a direction based on these distances. I'm just going to set it to zero and then pretty big. So we can see all the ones around the curve have been moved up uh, at a value of eight right now. And it looks a little bit like random noise, but when we construct the pyramids, the mesh will be quite visible, uh, which we'll do right now. So. Does everyone see points moving only the ones they want to select around the curve? And they should update too if you move this first slider. It's kind of nice. Okay, so if everyone's seeing that, uh, we can move on to the next step, which is actually constructing the mesh off of these points. And in order to do that, um, we have a component called Delaney Mesh. And what this will do is it'll take uh, points and it'll construct poly polygonal faces based on the points. So we'll use that. And right now, what this is doing is it's triangulating points. So it'll take three points, and it'll make a triangle surface face based on those three points. So we'll need to construct all of the points for the Delaney mesh to function. Right now, we have a list of points that are just all together, which is not helping us too much, because we want each individual pyramid to be its own set of points that we can construct a pyramid for each one of them. Right now, they're in really no organized manner. So what we can do is we'll come back to the beginning again, and we have these diamond panels, uh, the diamond surfaces from here. And what we can do with the diamond panels is deconstruct the, since they are B-reps, we can deconstruct them as a B-rep. 
what this will give us is it'll give us a face list, an edge list, and a vertice list. So we'll grab that and we'll take the diamond output and plug that into the B input, so the base B rep. And now this is another way to analyze a B rep, just like we've been analyzing surfaces and curves and all that. And the important thing here is it's giving us a list of vertices for every single B rep. And since all the diamonds themselves are separate B reps, you can see we're getting a tree with a branch of four vertices for each diamond B rep in the list. So we had 340 diamonds. And if we look at the V output, we have 340 branches on this tree, each one of them with four points aligning to the four corners of each diamond. So we'll take that and we'll move that again over to the right side of the canvas. So we have all of this over on the right side as well. So now we're starting to see some structure um, in the data. So uh, each branch has four points. And then we also have the fifth point of each pyramid uh, in the move component, which are all the ones that we moved up. This is going to be the center of that pyramid the top part here. So we have these four base points uh, right there. And we have the fifth one that we moved up or we kept it at zero, depending on which, which one it is. So what we can do now is construct triangles um, for each panel, just like this. So we'll be constructing four uh, surfaces with those five points. So we can start to add these together now. One thing to note is that each branch, so branch at zero, 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 is going to correspond to the uh, item, the point here at the index zero. Same for index or branch one is going to be index one, branch two is index two, so forth, on and so forth. So we'll need to combine these together to be one list of points that can just plug in to the P input here of the Delaney mesh. So in order to do that, we looked at replacing items in a list. But now we want to add on that fifth point. We want to insert this fifth point into the list of four. So we can use an insert items component. Uh, this works in the same way as the replace, except now we're adding a piece of data into a list instead of replacing one of them with a different value. So we have the original list here, which is going to be just all the vertices of the B rep. So we can add that into the insert items. And we also know which point we want to insert. So we want to insert you know, index zero into branch zero. And we'll want to insert it at the end of each one of those lists. So we can put these together. So we have the moved points, the translated geometry coming out of G. We can add that into the input here. So the items that we want to insert, so the second input down. And one thing you might notice is that we have two wires here, one of them dotted, the other one not dotted. Uh, in this case, the data is not going to be aligned at all. What this is going to try to do is it's going to try to put all 340 of these items at the end of each one of these 340 lists, um, which is not great because we only want to put one point into each list instead of all of them into every list. So what we can do for that is just graft this G and to do that, we can right click on the uppercase G, just come down here and hit graft. That'll convert it into a dotted line, but it's also converting it into one item per branch. So we have uh, index zero now on branch zero. So now that branch zero aligns with the branch zero of the four points uh, from the panels to start. So now we know uh, everything is aligned and we can put those points into the branches that they should be at. The only thing left is to define at which uh, index it's going to fit. So we have our original panel with four points. Um, we've put those points. So we have index 0, 1, 2, and 3. We've put one of those points in each one of these positions. And we want to take this fifth point now and add that into the fifth position. So index number 4. And then this one is going to be the top of the pyramid. So in order to do that, um, we can just tell it to put each one of these points at the index four of every single branch. So we can grab a panel with the integer four. 
add that in to the lowercase i. And now what we should be seeing, if you hover over the L output, is we have 340 branches, each of them with five points in the branch. So we've added that fifth point into the fifth position at index four. So now that we have that, we have all the points required to start constructing um, the Delaney mesh, so the triangulated mesh based on those points. So we can plug all of those points with the dotted line into the P input of the Delaney mesh. And we'll start to get pyramids coming out of the surface. Um, mine are quite dramatic just because I made this number very high. One thing too though, um, some of the pyramids might have issues. We can see these pyramids on the edge here. Uh, they're not closed off. They have random open surfaces. This on this side, this one is it's just missing half of it. So there's one more thing we can do to make sure that doesn't happen and everything is super clean. And that's just to fulfill the last input here. So the plane input for the Delaney mesh. What it's trying to do right now is say the base of each mesh. So the, the, the face that's open is going to be on the XY plane, which is not true for every single pyramid here, just because each pyramid is going in its own unique direction. So XY is not going to work as a blanket uh, statement. So we'll need to define a plane for every single position on this plane. And if you, you remember back to the evaluate surface, if I turn this back on, we have a plane at every single point already. Um, and that's going to be the F, the frame here at UV. So the frame, we have this plane uh, that's bounded to the bottom of every single pyramid already. Um, all we have to do is make sure that this list, if we were to wire this out, is not dotted. So we'll just want to make sure before we plug it in to graft the plane input for the Delaney mesh. Um, for the same reason that we grafted the move component, um, we want to put each plane on its own branch. So all the data aligns 340 branches in my case. So that all looks pretty good there. I'm just going to preview off everything that's not the Delaney mesh. And now we should be seeing very clean pyramids uh, forming on top of this surface. And if you were to change any of the sliders um, from the beginning of the workflow, so the sliders for the distance, which uh, one thing we can do to keep track of what sliders are what is we can add in this, it's not really a component, but we can add in a note. If you type in scribble, um, you can get a note that just pops into the canvas. And if you double click and, and do what it asks, you type in a title or a note for yourself, and we can just say this one is going to be the distance sliders. So that'll rest there. And then this other group that we made, the other construct domain, if we copy and paste this, is just going to be um, the height of each of the pyramids. So now just at a glance, we know the first one is going to relate to how many points we're including off of that curve. And then the second one is going to be the actual height of the pyramids, either below or above the surface if we go positive or negative. So uh, is that not working for anyone? Is everyone seeing movement on the pyramids? Yeah, cool. I will grant you though, it's a little bit hard to see them at this point because they're all transparent and they're all the most basic geometry they are. Um, each one is just four triangles together. So it's pretty rough at this point in time. Yes, that is the FX output of the evaluate surface. Make sure it's grafted. Um, for everyone that it's working for, 
Can you see anything that we're missing from the panels at this point in time? There's one crucial part of the surface we haven't looked at yet. I don't have a guess. Um, so if you look around the edge of the plane, you see we've neglected any of the triangles at this point in time. Um, we only have worked on the, the diamond shapes from the diamond panel. Um, so right now, if we were to preview off the surface, the edge of it is pretty jagged, um, which isn't you know, meeting the goal of using the entire surface. So we'll want to make use of the triangles as well. These are a bit easier because we're not moving the midpoint of these triangles at all. We're not editing them. We're just keeping them as triangles. So we'll just want to do this end process here where we deconstructed and then constructed a mesh um, from those points. So again, we can come back to the triangles, do what we did before, deconstruct them, just the triangles. So we get the vertices of the triangles. And we'll just drag that deconstruct over to the end, the right side of our script again. Sorry, I deconstructed mesh. That is that is very wrong. Um, these are B reps. Uh, the data type does matter. We'll deconstruct B reps. Okay, that looks a lot better. Now we're actually seeing correct data mapped onto the triangles. So with deconstruct BREP, we'll drag this over to the right again. And then we should have three vertices in each branch of this, uh, of this tree. We can use another Delaney mesh with the vertices. Very simply, just plugging them into the point input, and that will automatically construct mesh faces just on the triangles. So that part was a lot simpler. We've, we've edited these, not at all. We're just constructing meshes out of their faces. OK, so now we have all the meshes we need. Um, the last thing we'll strive to do is to smooth out this surface to make it a lot uh, cleaner, a lot smoother. So it's not these jagged triangles. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to use some of the subdivision techniques that we went over last class with Weaverbird. Um, so we'll get to that in a second. There's a lot of different options from Weaverbird, again, in the sub D section. Um, we'll take a look. Let's just take a look at a couple of them. So we'll do the Catmull Clark. We'll do this loop one. Um, we do this mid edge subdivision. And we'll just play with all three of these and see what they look like. You can use whichever one you want, though. Uh, it's not going to matter too much. But uh, we cannot just plug the meshes into these at this moment. Uh, right now, the most obvious thing is the two meshes are in separate data streams, which is the first issue. The second issue is they're still all in branches. So there's one face per branch, which we'll need to combine everything before we smooth everything out. If we just did it right now, we would just smooth out every single piece and uh, it'd be detached very quickly. So um, does anyone remember from last class how we would kind of merge meshes all together into one mesh? No? I see a W on someone's lips. It does start with a W, huh? Well, yeah, we'll just weld them together. And the best way to do that is actually to use Weaver Bird's uh, join meshes and weld. That'll do two steps at once. It'll join all of our meshes together. Granted, the list is flat. We'll have to do that. It'll join them, and then it'll weld them. So we'll take all of those edges. It'll make them one, and we'll have one very clean mesh. So we'll grab that. Um, we'll want to make sure the input for the mesh is flattened so that we're looking at all of the faces together as one. And then we can wire in both of the Delaney meshes into this mesh input. Again, if you're putting in two wires, just hold Shift while you're plugging in the second wire, and that'll add them both to the same input. If you don't want to do that, you could also use the merge component to do the same thing without having to hold down any hotkeys and just run this in. Either way works. We'll just make sure they're both going in. So if we look at the output now, we have one single mesh coming out. Uh, everything is joined, welded, 
very pretty. Okay, so before we go into the subdivision modifiers, um, the f just before we do that, there's a couple things that we can do to clean it up to make sure no one has any weird issues uh, with this process. Um, but everyone should have Kangaroo by default. And in Kangaroo, where is it? It has this component called combine and clean. Um, this one will just remove any unused stuff that we don't need from the list, uh, just as a safety thing. And then um, going back to Weaver Bird, there is also a component called Unify Face Windings. What this one does is it just makes sure that every face is all pointing in a common direction. So I'll grab that and then make a drawing to explain. Uh, we've made these pyramids out of triangles. And uh, triangle. we just want to make sure that if the normal of this one is facing this way, we don't want the normal of the one next to it to be facing in the complete opposite direction. Um, this is unifying the face winding, so that'll make sure they're at least pointing in a common, common enough direction, which in this case is going to be vertical. So that's what this one is going to do. So we'll just plug that together. So now everything should be pretty clean, and we can start plugging these into the subdivision modifiers and seeing what these look like in Rhino. Um, again, one thing to do uh, is we could come up to the uh, document preview settings, this little orange circle in the top right. Um, this one, we can make sure that our preview color is not translucent. It'll make it a little bit more difficult to see what we're doing. You could also change the color if you like. We don't need to do bright red. We can just see what this looks like in a couple different subdivision methods. Uh, up to you which one you think looks best. Well, I'm just going to stick with the one that we used last week, uh, which is the Catmull Clark. It's no simple one. We can also change the, the level of smoothing as well. You can do that with the slider. Uh, so it doesn't have to be one. One's not going to do too much to our smoothing. Two. Uh, would do a lot more. So we can see that pattern now. And this uh, Catmull Clark subdivision component is also pretty nice because it has this other input at the bottom here called smooth naked edges. Uh, this one by default is uh, is smoothing them out, but it'll also keep these these corners pretty sharp, which we like because that'll again keep our uh, input surface as it was. So hopefully that's working for everyone. Should be getting some nice pattern there. On. And now we should be able to play with our inputs and everything should work. So we can see this pattern uh, changing as we change all of these sliders. And just to note, the curve itself is is flat, so anywhere where the curve is far away from the surface, it'll be a little bit different than where it is close. I'm actually gonna bake this in and use it again 
So now at this point, we should be able to edit this curve. And when we edit it, the pattern will also update as we move these points around. Cool. Anyone have issues or questions with that one? No? Uh, do you mind zooming out my computer for yeah, a totally. few minutes? Yeah, I'll give everyone a few minutes to um, let's go with this. I'm assuming you just need some of the later part. Yeah, just the unify. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. It froze on joining the meshes. Gotcha. Okay, so at 620, we'll take a look at the, um, the pattern on the arm now and see how far we get with that one. It's, uh, it's not, not that complex. It's a lot shorter than this one. Um, let me know if anyone still needs the components, but if not, we'll uh, continue on. Okay, so if you preview on these two components down here, we should be seeing something like this. So what we have is a 3D scan of someone's arm from previous years. And then we've also set up uh, two planes here to define uh, in what section we want to wrap this pattern around. So we'll wrap something in between these two points. Um, yeah, this was a question I got last week, and it works with today's topic, so we'll take a look at that. Um, what we'll be doing is we have this arm, and we have a defined start and end point, and we can use the diamond pattern again, but in this case we can wrap it around the arm, so it'll kind of look like this sort of, giving us a pattern. Um, and we'll look at how to do that on a mesh if you were to 3D scan something as a, as a common enough workflow. Um, so what is the best way to do that? So what we can do is actually make a surface. Um, because again, if you remember from Lunchbox, the diamond panels, one of the inputs here is a surface to map, a, uh, to map these panels onto. Um, it can't use a mesh just because a mesh does not have UV values. So it's not going to know where to put, you know, these panels. So a surface will work a lot better for that. So the question is, what's the best way to define a surface on a mesh that we can use to put panels on? So we don't need this right now. But um, if you remember back to the Voronoi tutorial where we took a mesh intersection from two meshes and found a curve, we can do that again here, uh, mapping curves up this arm to then make a surface in between. So uh, how can we do that? The best way that I think there is to do that is these components called, uh, let's see. There's two options here, perp frames and perp frame. Uh, which one is best? We can use the perp frames component. So this one with multiple cur multiple planes in it. And this will allow us to construct planes based on a line going from the start and the end of our planes. Um, we'll need to de define a plane to start. So right now, these are just triangles in the scene. If you wanted to bake these and move these around, you could easily do that. 
Um, but we'll want to actually construct planes out of these to start. So these meshes are really easy to move because you can't really have a plane, like a plane data type in Rhino, but we can have them here. Um, what we can do though is with these meshes, we can construct a plane out of them. And there's a lot of ways to make planes. I'll actually look in this list here. Uh, in the vector tab, there's a lot of different ways to make planes. The way we can use here, since we have these triangles, is we can do a plane based on three points, um, which I have that component there, so plane three point. And this will construct a plane based on three points, A, B, and C inputs. So we'll just need to find the vertice inputs from these planes here. And just like we did in the last workflow, the easiest way to do that is going to be to deconstruct the B reps which these planes are, if we hover over, we've got surfaces, which are also B-reps. So by deconstructing those, we have the vertices. We have three vertices per face. And now we'll just need to convert these from one output into three outputs, A, B, and C. So the easiest way to do that is to use a list item component. And since we we'll only ever have three points and we know we want three points at all times. We can zoom into this list item and the closer we get, these plus buttons should pop up. And if we hit the plus button below the eye, we can see what this will do is it'll uh, start to give us more index outputs. So we have index zero and then we have index one and two as we go down. We can add as many of these as we want, but we know we only ever have three. So zero, one, and two. If we use the vertices from the deconstruct in the list. What this will do is it'll give us uh, at lowercase i, it'll give us index 0, 1, and 2. And now we have three outputs that'll match our three inputs. So we can wire those over, a, b, and c. And now we'll actually get planes or frames, whichever you want to call them, visualized in Rhino. And with these planes, um, something we can do pretty easily is use this component called the plane through shape. And what this will give us is it'll give us a plane um, that extends beyond the bounds of any geometry input. So if we ever want to do any cutting uh, of a surface or of a mesh or whatever, um, this will give us a plane that is bigger than the entire thing. So we always know we're going to get a clean cut. So we have two planes for the surface plane input. And we also have uh, the shape uh, as geometry of the mesh arm. So we can wire those both in. And we can see we're getting rectangle planes, surfaces, that are bigger than the bounds of the arm by a small margin. So everything is included. And this is really easy because we don't have to tell it how big to make the surface or where to make the surface. It's just going to make it bigger than the shape itself. Okay, so now that we have these two surfaces, um, a really easy way to make planes in between them uh, is to use some components from Pufferfish, which we should have downloaded as a plugin. Um, and that comes with a lot of components. I'll actually pull up the panel. Um, yeah, it's got all these components here for tweening between things. So basically a component that does a between operation, uh, which is referred to as tweening in Grasshopper. So the one we can use here is uh, tween two surfaces. And this will start creating surfaces between the two that we have currently, which is perfect. So we have two surfaces here. You'll notice they're uh, grafted on two different branches, uh, which, is, uh, which is not great. So we'll go ahead and flatten those. So we just have two surfaces. And then we can do the same trick that we did to grab the three vertices out of the planes. 
to grab the two surfaces into the A and B inputs that it's asking for. So one for A, one for B. So we'll grab that list item again. And plugging the surfaces into the list, we can zoom in and add a plus one below the I to give us the service at index zero for A and the index at, uh, or the service at index one for B. And if we plug those together, we'll get a third surface in between, uh, which is a good start, but there's a lot more options here for this pufferfish component, specifically in the factor input. Right now, it's just giving us a surface in the middle, so at factor 0.5. So 0.5 is directly in between 0 and 1. Um, and that's a good start, but we can add a lot more if we change this factor input. Uh, easiest way to do that is to grab a range, which will give us a list of numbers. By default, it's between 0 and 1, which is perfect, because uh, if we look at this component, we can see that surface A is equal to 0 and surface B is equal to 1. So if we put a range of values, we don't even need to add any, any inputs here. If we give it a range of values, it'll add surfaces from 0 up to 1, and then also 1 as well. So now we have all of these surfaces here. Um, so now that we have surfaces and we have the mesh of the hand, uh, it's really easy now to use a trick we did before, which is the mesh intersection. Again, you could type mesh, mesh intersection, or you could type the abbreviation of MMX, and it'll grab that component. And we have the surfaces for A and the mesh of the arm for B. And if we preview off everything except for the intersection and the arm, now we have curves that travel down the length of the arm, which is very nice. Okay, so now that we have these curves, the easiest way to make a surface between curves is to loft curves together. Um, I've noticed that Pufferfish has a very nice loft command as well um, called unsplit loft surface. So I'd recommend to use that one. We can see the difference between both, I guess. Um, So before we plug these curves into the loft, we just want to make sure they're all flattened, so they're all on the same list, so it can make a loft between all of them. So we can go ahead and flatten those. And if we plug those into S, see how long that takes. Hopefully not too long. Hmm. This might have been a Kool Aid situation. Um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I was going to show how this is the wrong way to do it. <laughs> and then clean it up and make it better. Wait, did it actually work for you? Oh, okay. Oh, so it came back for everyone else. That's. That's cool. Yeah, it's like I can do that. Okay, is it still loading for anyone else? Oh, wait, it did something. Good. I was going to quit. Hey, it worked. Okay. So mine worked, but we can see how this is the bad way to do it because uh, nothing is nothing. None of the curves are aligned, even though the curves all look like similar curves. Um, the direction of the curve, the start and end of the curve, the orientation of the curve—they're all random, kind of at this point, and we can see that based on how the surface is kind of very random and also very dense uh, with a lot of a lot of points to it. 
Um, so we can clean this up a little bit. Uh, the first thing we can do, I would recommend maybe just deleting this for the time being so it doesn't update at all. Um, and the first thing we can do is actually reduce these curves by removing the least significant vertices. So that's the first thing. This is just a standard grasshopper component. Um, and we'll need to give it a tolerance value. Uh, it's usually somewhere between 0 and 1. Uh, I think a value of 0.3 is going to work pretty well. So you could use a panel, you could use a slider. What this is going to do is it's going to get rid of the complexity of some of these curves. So if I turn off that mesh, we can see originally we had these curves that were, they were, you know, really well fit to the arm because they were the perfect cutouts. We've reduced it. Now we have a lot less vertices. You can see the lines have, have lost a little bit of resolution, um, but that, that's really fine for what we're doing here. We don't want all that resolution as we saw by the loading times. Um, you're just plugging in the output of the mesh intersection. They, if you hover over X, they should be polyline curves. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> okay, did that? Is that? Okay. Um, so now we've reduced it. Um, but one thing that we'll do next is say one curve has a one, two, three, four kind of edges on it, and the other one has like 20 or something. Um, the loft is not really going to know what to do, like where to put, like where is it going to put these? It's going to put them all together. So that's not the best if the number of uh, edges is out of line with all of the different curves here. So one thing we can do to fix that is we can first test to see with control polygon, um, what this will do is it'll tell us how many control points we have on the curve. So if you remember from last class when we were drawing the curves in Rhino and then pulling the dots around, those were the control points. So we'll want to make sure each curve has the same number of control points. So we can run the curves into the input here. Now we can see we get polyline curves and we get from the P output the control polygon points and they all have a different range of numbers. They're close, but they're not the same. So what we can do is uh, just tell it how many, poly how many control points it should have. So maybe we'll do something like 15. We'll just go on the lower side. Um, but up to you. You can put in whatever number you want. I'm, just, I'm looking at the numbers here and just picking one of them. 15 looks like in the middle, just about. And then we can rebuild the curves with rebuild curve. And uh, there are two of them, but do the one without the hammer on it. Um, so this one is the just the grasshopper basic component. The one with the hammer, I think, is from Pufferfish. And it's got two inputs here. So the curves to rebuild and then N for the number of control points. So we have this number that we defined. And we also have the curves from the reduce. Make sure to take it from the reduce. We'll wire that in. So now we have the curves again, but now each of them has 11 control points on it. So that's all aligned. And then don't, I mean, you could do this, but if I do the loft again, um, we can see it, it doesn't take any time to compute, but it's still a little all over the place. It's not in line yet. So there's a couple last things to do to line up all of these curves. Um, the first one is going to be to flip curve. And this is a, it's the inputs here, curves to flip and then an optional guide curve. 
So we can start by plugging in the curve to C. And then let's just see again if this has updated anything. So if we compare, um, we can see it's doing something. Uh, at least all the curves are flipped in the correct direction now. But one last thing we can do is use this component called pufferfish called align curves. And what, uh, actually align, that's not in pufferfish. It should be align curve seams. So align curve seams. Again, we can take the curves, plug them into the C input here. And now it should show us some, some vertices, and they should all be kind of in a line, as, as close as they can get. And let's see, let's turn this back off. I'm getting an error that says curve select increase open curves. Okay, so if you have open curves, you can just add in this component called close curve. I would just put it maybe after the rebuild curve. That should, that should clean that up. It'll probably still have an error because if, if a curve is already closed, it can't do it again, but this should get any of the ones that are, that are open if they are open. Okay, so at this point, it's a little bit better. Um, one thing. Okay, so the last thing we can do is um, it's saying that the guide curve on the flip curve is optional, but it's looking like, at least in my case, uh, optional is not good enough. So we can actually define which curve it's going to use as the guiding curve to flip everything to. Uh, the easiest way to do this is we can use the, a list item again. All I'm using the list item for is to grab the very first curve. So the curve at index zero, which looks like this green one up here. We can use this as the guide to just say every other curve should follow the direction of this curve. And if we plug that into G, um, now all the curves are aligned and they're all flowing in the correct direction. And now the unsplit loft surface is actually functioning uh, very cleanly and everything uh, is in order. So all the curves are very clean. Okay, hopefully everyone is getting a clean surface. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'll come look at it. Whenever you get that, it's kind of grasshopper just telling you it doesn't know what the problem is. Uh, it's a very vague. Okay, so we pretty much have the surface here. Um, one thing we could think about is tolerances. So if this surface is right on the actual mesh of the arm, there's gonna be no uh, play between the arm and the mesh, uh, which might be too tight. So we can really easily uh, use this offset surface component to, to just simply define how far away we want the surface to be from the arm itself. So let me preview this on real quick. So yeah, right now with no offset, it's, it's inside the arm, which isn't great. Um, but we can use a slider with pretty much any numbers and actually tell it how far away it should be. And it's looking like that's going inside the arm. So I'll make this negative.
Is it a uh, is it a little slow? Um, yeah, hopefully it comes back. One thing also too is uh, if you're seeing like I'm seeing, there's a little gap in between the surface here. Um, we can add a, a Boolean toggle. There's an input for the unsplit called closed. If we just make closed true, um, that should clean up our issue of uh, being open right here. Which uh, that is that is some actually actually never mind. Do not do that. It's not doing what I thought it would do. Okay, so now that we have this surface, hopefully you still have a computer and a surface. Um, we did all this just to keep a surface because we need it for the diamond panels. Um, so we can hide all this stuff, it doesn't matter anymore. And again for the UVs, we can plug in some integers into U and V. To give us a custom mount. Okay, and with these diamonds, the last thing we can do um, to kind of make a, a wireframe, space frame structure on this arm is first to extract the edges of the B-Rep. You could get that by deconstructing the B-Rep as we did before, or there's also a component just called B-Rep edges, which comes with Grasshopper, uh, which will just very simply just find all of the edges from a B-Rep. Um, and they're all broken down here into different lists, but the only one that has any edges in it is the uh, this edge curves output. Um, so with this, you could pipe these curves, but the quickest option if you wanted to go to 3D printing, which is a lot of what the class is around, uh, is we can use Dendro to very quickly make uh, pipes that are kind of smoothed out and very clean based off this list. So we'll use Dendro again. A lot of the endings of workflows, we'll, we'll use Dendro uh, for the purpose of it makes nice 3D prints. Um, and we'll use this curve to volume component from Dendro. This will take curves. Uh, it'll make it into a pipe with some radius value. Um, so we'll need to define First, the Dendro settings, as always. So there is this create settings component. And if you remember from last class, uh, we always make a slider from, say, 0.01 to 1. Uh, and this will be our detail setting. So we'll, we'll put that. Always good to start high, and then we can work our way down. Um, but these are, these are the settings. We'll also need a radius. So we can do which, what, uh, whatever slider you kind of want for the radius. It's probably going to be somewhere also within 0 to 1. So we'll use that as the radius input. And then we have the curves. We can see coming out of this first, uh, first output, 
we have all of the curves. Um, but it'll be great to make sure they're flattened when they come in. So we make uh, pipes around all of the curves at once. So we'll flatten that. Um, if they were not flattened, they would not all be joined together in this process. So we can wire those in. Um, you can see I'm getting an error saying that the radius should be at least 33% larger than the voxel size. That's just saying the radius should be larger than the voxel size input. So I'll just bring this down until we see something working um, on the screen. So we can change those numbers around until you see something that looks it looks fairly good on your screen. And then the very final thing to do, uh, if you want, is just to smooth everything out. Um, so we can use a smooth volume from Dendro to do that. And you have some options here to change how smooth it is, just with the iterations input. Uh, this is a integer value, so a whole number. So you can, you can, by default it's one, but you can have any number you want here. And that'll just make it a lot smoother than how it started. So this is kind of cleaning up a lot of the, uh, any of the disparities we had in the, the mesh from earlier. And at this point we should be able to update um, any of the settings that we had here to change what this pattern looks like. So we could have a lot more, a lot less uh, holes in this mesh. Could change the offset if you dare. We could also have the offset um, directly influence the radius of the curve as well. So I could use this offset value. I'm just gonna flip it because it is negative in my case. And if we change the offset, that could also influence the radius of the curves as well. So when the offset is farther away, the curves automatically also get larger to compensate. So you could include that functionality if you like. And then if you wanted to bake the planes into Rhino, we could also move these around to change uh, how much well, you know, it should work. Um. Okay, you could move this around, although it seems unreliable with uh, which direction it offsets it every time it does this. Okay, but other than that, that's it I, uh, for all I have today. Um, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> you're always welcome. Hopefully that works out. Um, 
yeah, that's it. Uh, please go home. <laughs> <laughs> um, if anyone had questions about the challenge crate from last week, let me know. I forgot to ask about that, but you know, I'll be here for four more minutes. So. Wait, RJ. Yeah, what's up? I'm getting the issue solution except exception Dendro API assembly unknown. Okay, are you on Mac or Windows? Mac, yeah. Okay, that's probably why. If you're running oh. on Mac, yeah, it's just not written for it. Um, oh, you okay. Also, it. Got it. If you have seven, you could play with multi pipe. It's another yeah. option that'll do a lot of curves into like a pretty clean pipe setup. So you could play with that. So or you I, could just use the pipe that comes with it. So, pipe B rep edge to pipe instead of curve to volume. Yeah, so you could, if you're using like multi pipe or whatever, instead of going to curve, you could just go like that. And then sure. I'm not going to do it right now, um, just so I don't crash. I, it yeah. should work. Oh, it should work. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Uh, it, yeah. Welcome. Yeah, it worked. It worked no problem. Okay, cool. Perfect. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye. Right, have a good evening. Yeah, you too. Bye. Yeah. Uh, you wanted us to do anything over Spring Break that involved so like, thinking about it, so what final projects you want to do? That's a really good point. You definitely could. Um, for final project stuff, it doesn't really change for a semester. So um, this is usually like the guide. This is some past work too. This is usually the guidelines. Um, and I'll put this like in, in our Discord as well uh, after class. But it's basically think about um, anything that you could theoretically 3D print that you could wear and move with. So it's not just going to fall off when you move. Um, that is also somehow bounded by uh, uh, like a dynamic process in Grasshopper. So anything with a slider, like if it's changing the thickness or changing the amount of panels on a surface or something like that, that's like the the three requirements. Can you wear it? Can it be like editable in Grasshopper? Yeah, it's whatever you want. Oh yeah, if you want to wear it. You're gonna help us scan ourselves, right? Yeah. After spring break, we'll do a 3D scanning, 3D printing. I, I kind of okay. Nice. Nice. I wanna make grills. Wait, grills is really funny because um, wait, what is his name again? What's their uh, Oh, it's Jake. Yeah, yeah. So Jake, uh, about two hours ago, came by my apartment and dropped off his uh, dental molds. From the dentist yeah and he asked me if i could 3d scan them and then make grills like resin prints and grills <laughs> so um it's a really good idea i have not tried it yet i think they have kits like after they do they do make your own dentures. yes so i could try to do that and then bring it in you definitely should because you can get the negatives with the mold and then you just have to make the positive positive. and i'm i'm thinking about now like can you use the mold and 3D scan the negative, or do you have to make the positive? He gave yeah. me positives, which is really nice because I think that'll be easier to scan with your phone. Yeah. We'll have to see. But yeah. I guess this will be over. If I have time, with all the time in the world that I don't have, um, I will try to make these uh, make these grills for him. But uh -huh. oh, I have not seen. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, that's cool. Like really close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, I'll have to check that out. Okay, okay, that sounds fun. Yeah. Okay, and I've definitely seen it before. I'm like, it sounds familiar. Um, but yeah, 3D scanning is like a great way to make these super couture, like well-fit pieces. Um, so yeah, anything, anything you're thinking of for a project, like. <laughs> And I mean, we've had people in the past take wearable to mean whatever they want it to mean. Uh, it's we've we, we've worn buildings before, so it's pretty open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 